The Ten Kings Time Script, Part 4. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. Hitler Background. The more you start reading about Hitler and in different biographies and history as well, you start realizing the huge effort Hitler made just to conceal his own background. There were things that he wanted hidden that he did not want brought to light. Aspects of his upbringing, background, his lineage. There's so much that we don't know about his upbringing because he deliberately tried to hide some of that information. And for someone who is as prominent as he was and involved in politics for 10 years before he even became the Fuhrer, he had a lot of attention, so he had a lot of opponents who would try to dig up dirt on him as well all during that time. So he had a lot of people digging into his history, and so he also had a concerted effort all during that time to cover up his history. Then apparently he also had other individuals in high rank also working to cover up some of his history, his background in the army, and other activities while well, he was in Vienna as well. We actually know more so that it never was made to hide stuff, which really makes you want to dig in more, but you can't because there's not that much information. One of the biggest questions about Hitler is who was his grandfather? And when you particularly look at the history of his grandmother and step-grandfather, it's, it was a little messed up and already makes it difficult to understand. But there's a big question about who was his grandfather. And there are different stories. You see different accounts where people will, will make claims that maybe he had a Jewish grandfather. And that definitely came up even while he was in politics and all that. And there's about three different Jewish individuals that people claim that he was descended from. But... There's no hard proof of it, and obviously there's a lot that was hidden, so there's a lot that we don't know. We, of course, know his grandmother and his step-grandfather, and that was a close situation there, too. But obviously, whoever his grandfather was would impact who his father was. And Hitler's own immediate family with his dad and mom was a little messed up, too, because his dad was either marrying his first cousin once removed, or his half-niece, depending on the allegations. Some claim that his step-grandfather was actually his real father, just out of wedlock, but neither of them owned up to it. So that meant that Hitler's mom was his dad's first cousin once removed, or his half-niece. So even that whole situation was way too close overall anyway. But again, that brings up the question, who was the grandfather? It's already messed up the whole lineage. A little too close breeding anyway. But who was the grandfather? It doesn't help that Hitler's grandmother didn't say who the father was either. But what we do know that is very suspicious is that Hitler had a half-nephew, William Patrick Hitler. A somewhat distant relative, but very close also in his dad's line, obviously. However, once Adolf Hitler became chancellor, we do know that this half-nephew, William, he tried to blackmail Adolf Hitler two times trying to get a job under his now prominent uncle. But it's interesting that he tried blackmail because if you're going to blackmail someone, you have to have a credible, it has to be a credible threat or else people won't take it seriously. It's interesting though that Adolf Hitler did give him a job. And so he appears to have worked on the blackmail and regarded it as a threat. William claimed to have documents passed down through marriage and from the grandmother and through the family there showing allegations of who was the real grandfather. And he blackmailed Hitler that he had this real information. And while we do not know what it was, apparently Adolf Hitler had enough reason to believe, or maybe even saw it, that it was real and it was legitimate, the information that William had. And he gave him a job there in Germany. After a while, William got bored at that job, left the job, and then later he tried to blackmail Adolf Hitler again to get another job. But that time, Germany said you have to basically forfeit your British passport, basically, so you won't ever be able to leave, and he did not like that. But it is interesting enough that whatever information he did have was credible enough to where he could blackmail. There was the threat of blackmail for Adolf Hitler. He regarded it as legitimate that it needed to be addressed and swept under the rug. So, again, we do not know if he did have a Jewish grandfather, but we do know that Hitler acted on blackmail that he did not want to come to light. Whereas if his real grandfather was just another German peasant at that time, and, or maybe even his real grandfather, if that came to light, that would not have really been that great of a deal. But the fact that it appears 
there's a completely something from left field going on here that Adolf Hitler did not want brought to light. We do not know, but we do know whatever it was was legitimate enough that Hitler wanted to work on it because he wanted it hidden. So this is fascinating just to consider Adolf Hitler as a person alone. He had a sketchy lineage already. We don't know where it goes back to, but we do know it was with info capable of blackmail threats. Which means that the information of the lineage goes back to individuals that Hitler did not want the public to know about. And especially his political opponents or even the enemy nations. This is information he wanted concealed. Which implies very much that it is harmful information, not neutral information. And then of course also his heavily varnished youth activities. His later teens and into Vienna while he was a tramp. There's multiple biographers that bring that into question that it was not near as straightforward as he presented. He was involved with a lot of other activities that were not nearly as wholesome as he tried to present as the hero that he portrayed himself as. But it also shows, again, that whatever activities he was suspected of being involved with, which appears very strong to be homosexual activity, it appears to be in the realm of blackmailable information. Which means that... Because he took such great lengths to hide his lineage and also his activities over his late teenage years and early 20 years in Vienna, that alone shows you there's a lot of information he once kept out of public light. But you also know that there are individuals who would know that information, which means they do have some power and sway on Hitler from behind the scenes because that information, somebody will know that information. It will show up somewhere. But they made a big effort to heavily varnish his youth activities. And especially his time in the army. Very sketchy, very varnished. There's questions about his position. How did he get that position anyway? How did he get that award? A very prominent Iron Cross. The details of his injury do not add up. Doctors will tell you if he was gassed by mustard gas, even slightly, he would not have had the recovery that he claimed to have. And so there's a lot that's not true about Hitler's background. What was he really doing during the war? What position was he really in? He claimed to be an army dispatch, which the lifespan of those was not very long, but he apparently had that position for quite a while, so he was doing pretty good. And it also shows you that he was working not quite as close to the front lines as he purported to be, and he was probably working with higher-ups in the German army. So again, these are some of the details such as the book Hitler's The Pawn that points out some of these inconsistencies. And because later on in the account that he tries to sell to the public in Mein Kampf, he tries to sell himself as a brave soldier, injured and all that. And there's major questions that make you realize that most, most of that is probably not true at all. Particularly him being blinded by the gas and the injury and all that. He was obviously in the army. We don't know exactly what he was doing, but since there are parts that are being varnished and manipulated that also tells us again there are individuals in the army who would know the true records which means they also have pull and influence on Hitler too from the German army so there's multiple people who are interested in covering up his background because apparently he's doing things and he's involved in more than he's putting on at this early stage which is important because he's trying to portray himself as a revolutionary who's pulled himself up by his own bootstraps and he's going to be Germany's messiah and all that the self-made revolutionary whose only interest is in the good of his nation whereas when you look at the connections and his involvement with the army and then a lot of other blackmail hanging over him there's a lot of assistance that he has and people can pull and direct this puppet very early on. From even the time of World War I, there are people who are apparently already pulling his strings and already using him as an agent of some sort. Again, the more that you look at, there's a lot he doesn't want us to know, but we also know because of the positions he's in, there are people who do know the truth and they do know the information and they are going along with covering up and presenting a certain side of Adolf Hitler to the German public. Which again brings up questions of who all has pulled these strings here. And of course the post-war activity. The questions of was he a possible army agent. Because one of the first roles he was put into after the dispatch runner. And recovering supposedly. Being an education officer. And apparently going to investigate the German National Workers Party. And so a lot of this brings up the question of. 
how much was he doing this of his own volition versus was this a job and mission that he was sent on to be in this role, blackmailed into this role by those who knew his background and his lineage? There's a lot of these important questions, and there are rumors in Nazi Germany about the Hitler dossier that the army had on Hitler. Of all the people who would have known that information, the background information, it would have been the army. They would have had the background information, the activities that he was involved with in Vienna, because they would have access to the police and army records. And they would also be able to keep it all secret, too. And so it's this type of information that makes you realize or should get you start thinking, particularly when you see the type of person who Hitler is and how he matches everything for the seventh king, how there were people who were helping him. He did not just spring out of nowhere. He did not just pull himself up by his own bootstraps and become the savior of their nation. No, there are people who had a vested interest in keeping things quiet because he was very useful for their ends as well. He was a very perfect puppet for apparently the army because he had a certain spirit and camaraderie. He could pull people to him. And that was one of the main interests that the army was interested in, rallying the nation also. So the army did have vested interest in someone of a revolutionary nature, someone who is controllable. But as we're going to look at further, we also see there's a lot more people, primarily the children of darkness, who are completely surrounding Hitler at these young ages, around the army time, before the army time, while he was in Vienna, during the army time, and immediately after the war, he was surrounded by children of darkness who became his mentors. And so again, when you consider he's most likely being blackmailed, there are people, the army, we know they had a Hitler dossier on him. They knew the real information. And so there are multiple children of darkness and individuals pulling his strings early on, which is important to consider what happened 10 years later when he finally came to power in Nazi Germany as we know it. There's a lot that he was being used to repair the way in between the two world wars, which again brings us back to World War I. Already his position, what he was doing during World War I, is already sketchy from the get-go. So what was going on in Germany around the beginning of World War I? The success of German industrialization manifested itself in two ways in the early 20th century. The German factories were larger and more modern than their British and French counterparts. The dominance of the German Empire in the natural sciences, especially in physics and chemistry, was such that one-third of all Nobel Prizes went to German inventors and researchers. During its 47 years of existence, the German Empire became the industrial, technological, and scientific giant of Europe, and by 1913, Germany was the largest economy in continental Europe and the third largest in the world. Germany also became a great power, building the longest railway network in Europe, the world's strongest army, and the fastest growing industrial base. Starting very small in 1871, in a decade, the navy became second only to Britain's Royal Navy. Okay, so this is in 1913, 1914, right at the beginning of World War I. Germany is just about getting ready to eclipse Britain. Which is very important because that's where the city of London, the very influential financial power base is. And because of its growth with the industry and all that, Germany was getting ready to be the power broker that would take its place. So you can imagine the children of darkness who have a large vested interest in controlling the financial wherewithal of the world pulling those strings. They want to keep that dominant position. They want to keep London as the main controller. There's also interest prophetically because they do know other chess pieces has to be put into motion. They don't want Germany to become a dominant player. Especially at this early stage where it could supplant London and Britain real easily. They need to do things to rearrange the German Empire. They want to reshape the political makeup of several other things in that area as well, too. And that's why you wage wars again. You wage wars to create conditions and eliminate competition, too. And so we know some significant historical events with the excavations of the altar of Satan, the seat of Satan is going on right at this very important time because the children of darkness do know they are approaching a prophetic milestone Israel's captivity is going to be ending soon. They have to reshape the political scene to get things ready for that. 
but this is also the prophetic time when the seventh king is going to come onto the scene when he is going to be empowered by satan the seventh king this is the time for him because remember jesus christ said you will see all these things happen but the end is not yet the beginning of sorrows the seventh king will be during that time of the beginning of sorrows it's going to be a very rough time but he's going to be making his influence during that time the last generation will see that and they will know it from when he was and so this is happening at a prophetic time. The children of darkness know they are being allowed for the seventh king to come onto the scene at this time too. So these aren't just secular events that are just happening. Look at the spiritual side. What is going on with the seed of Satan? We look at the prophetic time. It's the early beginnings of the last generation. And in just a few years, Israel will be replanted. So the children of darkness, they already have their own minds and plans set on what they want to do with Israel. So they're going to need to start getting things ready politically to grab a hold of power in that area as soon as it's put into their hand. So let's look at the early life of Adolf Hitler going on in this context. And the more that we do so, we'll see how much was done very deliberately. The children of darkness knew this time was ripe for the seventh king to come on onto the scene. Of course, we know that Adolf's early life was a lot of abuse by his father. His father died in 1903. Hitler visited Vienna in 1906 when he went to the art school, but he was turned down because his art abilities were not really that great at all. They did suggest that he be an architect because he did seem to have inclinations to be an architect. He loved architecture. His whole life he loved architecture, but because he skipped out on school and was not interested in school, he did not have a lot of the prerequisites for an architectural school. So that's when he really realized he was so out of luck in multiple ways then in 1907 his mother died and so again when you look at and consider his background all the abuse that he went through the rejection the hating of authority being horrible in school grades skipping school tried to be an artist and even being turned down for that and then realizing he couldn't even pursue the next option because of choices he made up to that and then his mother died who he was really really close to there's a lot of very traumatic events that really shaped him during this time. And you can also see how it would form him to be isolated, very isolated, and to seek for affirmation in other ways too. But he eventually went back to Vienna with his friend Gustl. Gustl was going to a music school. Hitler didn't know what he was going to do, but he knew he had better luck in Vienna because his mother and father had died, so there's nothing there in that village there in Linz. So it's very influential, the time in Vienna. Because during this time, the Russian Jews were a very hot topic in Vienna. This time frame in Hitler's life, a lot was set in stone right here during this time in Vienna. And from those who knew him, people say prior to his time in Vienna, he was not anti-Semitic. Because they even had a Jewish family doctor who took care of his mother when she had cancer. And apparently he thought real good of them and even gave him a way out of Nazi Germany toward the end too. Gave him special protection. Thought well of him, even called him a noble Jew. He was not showing anti-Semitic inclinations while he was a teenager. But once he came to Vienna, there was a definite shift. Early on... Still, some of his colleagues and friends from the men's hostel, they said he was not anti-Semitic. He went to a Jewish social institutions and Jewish support for the hostel, soup kitchen and whatnot. Apparently, the largest customers of his paintings were Jewish. He sold a few to make some ends meet, but not a lot. But apparently, they were largely Jewish. So the first half, he was not anti-Semitic at all. He apparently indifferent. But later on, during his time in Vienna, he did become anti-Semitic. And even in Menkauf, he said that's where he did become very rabidly anti-Semitic. And by 1919, we already know he was already employing aggressive anti-Semitic statements, even before he wrote his book. So there is a shift in his thinking here in Vienna. But it's important to realize that the Russian Jews were a hot topic in Vienna when he came here. And this also needs to color your whole understanding of Germany and Austria, what was going on during this time of Hitler. A lot of people think Hitler changed Germany and made them anti-Semitic. He unfortunately didn't. He was playing on the pulse of what was already there, and he threw gasoline on the fire of what was already there, too. But let's look at the situation. Why were the Russian Jews such a hot topic? The Russian Jews 
here in Vienna? Well, we need it back way up to 1867 to Vienna. And they put into law what's called the Basic Law, which gave equal rights, including to the Jews. And this was very unique in Europe because there are a lot of restrictions wherever the Jews went. People trying to keep them out of business in certain main areas of cities and wherever. So there are a lot of restrictions wherever the Jews went. But here in 1867, Vienna said, Wait, we're just going to treat everybody the same. And so that started an influx of Jewish refugees coming to Vienna. Because they said, hey, we're finally going to be treated like decent human beings here. We won't have to go through so much anti-Semitism and restrictions on business and education and positions we can hold and all that. This, we can actually have a decent life here. And so this is instrumental because the modern Zionist movement started here in Vienna. Because is when this basic law went into effect that a lot of people... A lot of the Jews started thinking, hey, you know what? It would be so much nicer if we just had our own nation again. If we were just back in our own land again, we wouldn't have to put up with all this legal nonsense wherever we go. And we wouldn't have to be basically begging places like Vienna to even just treat us like basic human beings. And so this really started getting the sentiments going of the modern pre-Zionism movement. It started here in Vienna because it really started to get a taste of... Hey, you know, it's real nice to just be treated like a human being. Where we can pursue any career. We can pursue positions in government. We can be in the universities. We can live a normal life. And it would be really nice if we did not have to depend on a nation to offer that to us. If we just had our own nation where that was naturally the case. And so that really got the ball rolling toward modern Zionism. Here in Vienna, the same city that Hitler would come to quite a number of years later. Fast forward about two decades, there were pogroms in Russia. Large-scale wave of anti-Jewish riots swept through southwestern Imperial Russia, which is present-day Ukraine and Poland, from 1881 to 1884, when more than 200 anti-Jewish events occurred in the Russian Empire. And these were referred to as the Storms in the South. They really changed the perceptions among Russian Jews and also indirectly gave a significant boost to the early Zionist movement. Okay, so you have these programs, this persecution going on in southwestern Russia, near Ukraine. And so you're now having a bunch of refugees start come from Russia, or what we know as Ukraine, Poland area. And of course, they're going to safe places. Some are going to America because they know there's a land of promise over there. But some don't want to go that far, so they know Vienna is a very good, close option. And they have maybe some Jewish relatives there and tell them about the good jobs and businesses they have, and they can go to the universities. So you're starting to see an influx now of a lot of Jews being forced to move. Events are being manipulated to make Jewish people uncomfortable where they are, to bring up the subject of, hey, we really need our own land again. And we need to start packing our bags and making some effort to go to a place that is better than where we are now. Because up until this point, you know, most Jewish people were comfortable where they are. Even places where they had restrictions, so many restrictions on them in Russia and wherever. But now you're starting to see a movement. The Jews start moving and becoming restless by manipulated events. Somebody has vested interest that the Jews become restless where they are. Someone who has vested interest of applying some pressure to a modern state of Israel. And so at the turn of the 1900s, with the revolutions going on in Russia also, on top of that, more programs in Russia start a flood of refugees from the east to safe areas such as Vienna. And so you have several hundred anti-Jewish events going on in Ukraine, Poland area, Russia, and you have all these refugees coming to, this is, Vienna's the closest place. And it also has laws that are very open and equitable to just about anybody. So this becomes a hot spot for Russian Jews coming to this area. Which, of course, over the decades since that law went into effect, now you're starting to have a lot of Jews show up in Vienna. Which, anytime you have a sudden insurge of refugees, of course, there is displacement of the population that is already there. And that generates frustration and resentment. You know, we see that even today in Europe with migrants and refugees too. It just naturally causes resentment and friction. 
And so over these decades between when the law went into effect, you start having all these Jews flood into Vienna. And now it's getting to the point where the universities are, it's very noticeable the large portion of the people there are Jewish. And businesses, a large portion of the businesses in Vienna are Jewish and other legal positions and whatnot. And so, of course, that's generating friction. And so there's already talk from the natives there in Vienna, who were there first, of saying, hey, you know, things, things got to change. We can't allow this. There's different resentment that they had, and they wanted the situation to change back to what it was or send them to go somewhere else. They didn't like all these refugees just showing up. And so Hitler is arriving in Vienna where this is a hot topic. This is the frustration. And of course, he's going to start picking up on that and he's going to feel the pulse of the people of saying, hey, this is a hot topic by more than just one or two people. This Everybody's talking about this. Everybody's concerned about it. It hasn't gotten to blows yet, really. But it has gotten to the point where businesses and universities, they are calling for, hey, some things need to change here. But there are also other sentiments going on at the same time, too. And when we look at the history and the background and what we know Hitler was involved with and his upbringing and activities he was involved with, we know that definitely within this window, this was the approximate window when young Hitler was profoundly impacted by occult teachings and demonic influence. We know it was a very narrow window where he was definitely, he was an avid reader. And his friend Gus would say if he picked the subject to read on, he would read every single book he could get on that subject. So we know when he did start reading the occult, he would not just do it half-heartedly. He would read and absorb so much, everything he could get his hands on regarding the occult. And even his friend Gustel joked with him of, it was really half-joking, he said, of are you going to read the entire library? He was an avid reader, so we know he'd be totally immersed and marinated in whatever he applied himself to, and we know he applied himself to occult reading during this time. Right after a time where his father has died, he's lost some major career opportunities and his mother has died. So he's searching for answers. He's lost his way in life with so many disappointments already. So he, it's understandable to see why he would throw himself into the occult so much and really latch on to it with everything going on. And this time is when the first instances that we appear to know that he was demonically possessed during this time. Because in 1906, before he returned to Vienna, he and his friend Gustl, they went to Wagner's Rienzi Opera. And Hitler was just blown away by it. He had a abnormal reaction to it. Let's put it that way. His friend Gustl remarked about it, how it was completely abnormal. Hitler apparently was possessed. And even his friend Gustl described him as he acted like he was possessed. And Hitler basically was emphasizing or tried to tell his friend that he saw it, that he was appointed to be the Messiah that would save Germany or save his people. And he was apparently possessed. And then he would even reference this later on in life when he was talking to relatives of Wagner. He told them later on in life in that hour when he watched that opera that is when it began that's when his life mission began hitler knew that but apparently it was a demonic event he was possessed that definitely sticks out in gustel's writing and he remembered it and pointed out to hitler later on when they met 30 years later too that unique demonic event connected with wagner's rienzi opera of course, Wagner was very influential, and Hitler loved Wagner. He loved German mythology. What is the Rienzi? It's an early opera by Richard Wagner in five acts, with the libretto written by the composer after Edward Bueller Lytton's novel of the same name from 1835. The opera is set in Rome and is based on the life of Rienzo, a late medieval Italian populist figure who succeeds in outwitting and then defeating the nobles and their followers and in raising the power of the people. Magnanimous at first, he is forced by events to crush the nobles' rebellion against the people's power, but popular opinion changes and even the church, which had urged him to assert himself, turns against him. In the end, the populace burns the capital, in which Rienzi and a few adherents have made a last stand. Okay, so a people's revolutionary leader who comes onto the scene, even helped out by the Catholic Church, the Vatican, 
But eventually everybody turns on him, burns the capital, and he makes a last stand. Act 5 is very interesting. In the original performances, Rienzi's final words are bitter and pessimistic. May the town be accursed and destroyed, disintegrate and wither Rome. Your degenerate people wish it so. However, for the 1847 Berlin performance, Wagner substituted more upbeat rhetoric. Ever while the seven hills of Rome remain, ever while the eternal city stands, you will see Rienzi's return. Right after he's been betrayed by everybody, this people's ruler vows that one day he will return. Very interesting, these echoes, with this play that Hitler said was the beginning of his mission while he was demonically possessed. Right at the same historical time when the seat of Satan is being excavated and being brought to Berlin. The same place. Rienzi and Adolf Hitler. August Kubizek, a boyhood friend of Adolf Hitler, claimed that Hitler was so influenced by seeing Rienzi as a young man in 1906 or 1907 that it triggered his political career, and that when Kubizek reminded Hitler in 1935 at Beirut of his exultant response to the opera Hitler had replied, at that hour it all began. Although Kubizek's veracity has been seriously questioned, it is known that Hitler possessed the original manuscript of the opera which he had requested and been given as a 50th birthday present in 1939. Okay, so very important to him. The manuscript was with Hitler in his bunker. It was either stolen, lost, or destroyed by fire in the destruction of the bunker's contents after Hitler's death. The manuscript of Wagner's earlier work, Die Fein, is believed to have met with the same fate. Thomas Gray comments, In every step of Rienzi's career, from acclamation of leader of the Volk, through military struggle, violent suppressions of mutinous factions, betrayal, and final immolation, Hitler would doubtless have found sustenance for his fantasies. Albert Speer claims to have remembered an incident when Robert Ley advocated using a modern composition to open the party rallies in Nuremberg, but Hitler rejected the idea. You know, Ley, it isn't by chance that I have the party rallies open with the overture to Rienzi. It's not just a musical question. At the age of 24, this man, an innkeeper's son, persuaded the Roman people to drive out the corrupt senate by reminding them of the magnificent past of the Roman Empire. Listening to this blessed music as a young man in the theater at Linz, I had the vision that I too must someday succeed in uniting the German Empire and making it great once more. So you can see, also with the demonic possession and the non-normal events, this was very influential in Hitler's life, and it really questionably demonically set a pattern, a blueprint for what was about to happen. Almost a script, he would say, too. Who wrote Rienzi? Edward Bueller Lighton, an English writer and politician. He was Secretary of State for the Colonies, so a pretty smart guy. Rienzi, last of the Roman tribunes, he wrote that in 1835. Bueller Lighton wrote many other works, including Viril, The Power of the Coming Race, 1871, which drew heavily on his interest in the occult and contributed to the early growth of the science fiction genre. Its story of a subterranean race waiting to reclaim the surface of the Earth is an early science fiction theme. The book popularized the hollow Earth theory and may have inspired Nazi mysticism. Viril has been adopted by theophysists and occultists since the 1870s, became closely associated with the ideas of an esoteric Nazism after 1945. Okay, so this is suspicious. The same guy who wrote the blueprint that Wagner used with Rienzi also wrote this heavily occult book that was used by theophysists and occultists after that. The Coming Race is a novel by Edward Bueller Lighton, published anonymously in 1871, and has also been published as Real the Power of the Coming Race. Some theophysists, notably Helena Balavatsky, William Scott Elliot and Rudolf Steiner accepted the book as based on occult truth, in part. So this is important. They saw this as concealed truth. And they taught it accordingly, and it influenced their groups that followed after this. And this was published in 1871. The English Rosicrucian Society, founded in 1867 by Robert Wentworth Little, claimed Bueller Lighton as their grand patron but he wrote to the society complaining that he was extremely surprised by their use of the title as he had never sanctioned such. He didn't discount it, just he never sanctioned it. Nevertheless, a number of esoteric groups have continued to claim Bueller Lighton as their own, 
chiefly because some of his writings, such as 1842 book Zanoni, have included Rosicrucian and other esoteric notions. This guy knew esoteric stuff, and so that's why different groups latched onto him, and they saw his fictional quote-unquote books as disguised truth because they were in the occult, and they could recognize he's weaving in a lot of stuff that the normal occultist doesn't know. He's, he's higher up than he's letting on, which means to them it was concealed truth under the thin disguise of a story. And so that was why it was so influential, because they saw more in it that they recognized. Zanoni, an 1842 novel by the guy, a lot of occult inspiration in that, and apparently shows a lot of secrets that only someone higher up in that society would have known too. So that's why a lot of people claim him on that, because he definitely knew his subject. This is the guy who wrote Rienzi, which made such an impact as a blueprint and script apparently on Adolf Hitler, with a very strong occult influence by the writer. And of course, Wagner was... It's so influenced too, and Hitler absolutely adored Wagner. And so he absorbed all this. Adolf Hitler would have read Real Power of the Coming Race too, and been influenced with that too, especially at a very young age. We know he was reading this material. So again, when we fast forward and understand what was coming together, Hitler was so enamored with it because he was not just seeing it as an opera or a story. He was occultly influenced. He is demonically influenced at this point too, we know. And so we can see why it was so impressed on him. The demonic hearing voices, basically, the demon was basically speaking out through his lips. Gustav pretty much described that something else was talking from Adolf Hitler when he got so excited. It was not Adolf Hitler. And so we can see how he was so saturated. He was marinated in the occult already. And so at this point, it was so impressed on him that really set the blueprint in the mold for his mission going forward after this. He was a vessel at this point, even as a young teenager. He would be starting his work early on, planning his work, already seeing himself as a messiah, while he was still a teenager, with an occult purpose as a child of darkness toward those goals. So he's coming into Vienna while the Russian Jews are a hot topic. There's other national concerns going on. There's a lot of friction going on. He sees himself on a demonic mission. And so he's going to view all the problems of society through that lens going forward. Also, keeping in mind that he's being mentored and being directed and steered towards certain conclusions too. And because of his upbringing and all that, He's very open to manipulation, particularly with the demonic influence, too. So let's back up and look at some more influence. What's going on in this whole society? What's in this whole region? What are people already absorbing and used to in their outlook? Well, back in 1853, 1855, Count Joseph Arthur Gobineau wrote Essay on the Inequality of the Human Races. Now, that does not sound very wholesome. This book was embraced by the Nazis because obviously this would to them justify their views on higher races or lower races and all that. And that's why it was embraced by the Nazis. And so in this region, you're having these people write these books and they're being read and people are latching onto them because over time there are frictions coming into society. There are refugees and migrants coming into their society which are different than the people who normally live there. So they are latching on to certain writings that justify their prejudices. So you can see how there's a tension building over time in this whole area where there's a lot of migrants coming to. And the notions that are being put into the general populace's minds are not healthy whatsoever. Just to give you an idea of some of the occult explosion going on right now, that's when Albert Pike, he was the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, he wrote Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. So over in America, and just Freemasonry in general, really starting to solidify some of their views and really get it a little bit more less ad hoc too, but start getting a systematic blueprint for going forward too. Start getting more direction of how they were going to use their power and influence. And purportedly, it was Albert Pike who let out the information that they knew there was going to be three world wars. He wrote that to another revolutionary. So that's a hint of what's going on in the children of darkness behind the scenes 
during this time where in Germany you can start to see works of darkness, the hand of darkness, laying a certain foundation, laying a certain blueprint, getting a vessel ready, already knowing the script that they're going forward in. And multiple occult agencies know this script, apparently. Well, in 1871, that's when the Viril, The Coming Race, was published by Lighten. It has also been published as Viril, The Power of the Coming Race. So you're starting to see some subjects come up that are catching a lot of people's attention, and some are latching on to it because of their prejudices and also their occult influence, about a subterranean world occupied by beings who seem to resemble angels, who are descendants of an antediluvian civilization. They will claim the surface of the earth, destroying mankind in the process. It sounds like revelation, but this is supposed to be science fiction, remember? You can see why the occult was latching onto it, because they knew there is a kernel of truth to what he was writing. He wrote that in 1871, the rule of the power of the coming race influenced various esoteric authors, groups, and various forms prior to and during Nazi Germany, including Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy. Edward Leighton also wrote Rienzi, a book turned into a Wagner opera that Hitler was highly fond of about a Roman leader who vowed he would return. Hitler was also familiar with Viril, the power of the coming race. And so you're starting to see how multiple books are influencing multiple people. Gobineau himself met Wagner in 1876, promoted his work about racism. So then he took Rienzi, turned it into an opera, taking a lot of those thoughts too, and that's what Hitler ended up hearing and really getting impressed on him. It's these influential occult writers who are shaping the region's mindset. For real, the power of the coming race influenced various esoteric authors, groups, in various forms prior to and during Nazi Germany, including Helena Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy. And the Theosophical Society was founded in 1875, so just a few years later, with the help from Helena Blavatsky. And then the German Theosophical Society was founded in 1884. So those groups are really now setting up base in Germany, too. Helena Blavatsky was over in New Jersey, in America... Then in 1888, Helena Blavatsky wrote The Secret Doctrine, an influential example of the revival of interest in esoteric and occult ideas in the modern age, in particular because of its claim to reconcile ancient Eastern wisdom with modern science. That's the claim that it made, and so that played a part in its popularity. People thinking that's what it was, they latched onto it too. But Nazi Heinrich Himmler was fascinated with Blavatsky's writings. He started the National Heritage Institute as part of the SS. He would do this later, obviously. He sent archaeologists to various places, such as Tibet, to collect esoteric and occult information. So you can start to see a snowball getting going here of the occult influencing people's minds, influencing society, setting up different societies and groups here in Germany, which will play a role in what's coming with an agent that they are manipulating too. Based on information that goes back largely to this book, For Real, The Power of the Coming Race, which claims to be fiction, but really seems to mirror a lot from the book of Revelation too. Very interesting. 1902, Rudolf Steiner became General Secretary of the German-Austrian Division of the Theosophical Society. The World Teacher. In addition to the stated objectives, as early as 1889, Blavatsky publicly declared that the purpose of establishing the society was to prepare humanity for the reception of a world teacher. According to the Theosophical Doctrine described above, a manifested aspect of an advanced spiritual entity that periodically appears on earth in order to direct the evolution of humankind. The mission of these reputedly, regularly appearing emissaries is to practically translate in a way and language understood by contemporary humanity the knowledge required to propel it to a higher evolutionary stage. So, these occult works are getting society with their occult teachings, getting ready for the notion of a world teacher to come onto the scene, who will guide them supposedly to the next level of evolutionary advancement to an ascended state. You can see how they're setting the stage for what they know is going to be happening one day. The Hidden Masters. According to this view, humanity's evolution on Earth and beyond is part of the overall cosmic evolution. It is overseen by a hidden spiritual hierarchy, the so-called masters of the ancient wisdom, 
whose upper echelons consist of advanced spiritual beings. They know there is rulers in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. They try to put a more positive spin on it, but they do acknowledge it, that there are demonic forces controlling, ultimately, the children of darkness who are working here down on the surface level. The children of darkness do know there is a hierarchy and there are hidden superiors directing everything. And they emphasize that one day the world teacher is going to come onto the scene, bringing people to the attainment of perfection in consciousness with evolution and willing participation in the evolutionary process. Of course, those are the key words, willing participation. And if people are not willing to participate in that spiritual evolution, they will help them on their reincarnation journey by cutting off their heads because they are holding back humanity in their spiritual ascendancy and progression in evolution. So they are going to help them with that step on their own personal level. There is a really dark foundation that is being set in the world and being stirred and prepared with very multiple children of darkness vessels working at work to prepare a way for a certain individual who is about to come on the scene. They know what they're doing. They are very specifically following a script here early on, the late 1800s, preparing a groundwork, preparing for a certain individual. Also knowing that it will play a part later. There will be three world wars. And at this point, the first world war has not happened yet, but they do know it's on the horizon because they are already working to orchestrate things to steer the geopolitical events in their direction and to prepare the way for the vessel that they are already getting ready to mentor. 1898, Houston Stewart Chamberlain, who is nephew of Sir Neville Chamberlain, he was also the son-in-law of Wagner, which means they would be familiar with each other's beliefs. He wrote Foundation of the 19th Century. The book was demonically dictated. He was hypersensitive and neurotic. He was given to seeing demons who, by his own account, drove him on relentlessly to seek new fields of study and get on with his writings. He wrote his books in a veritable trance, claims he didn't even recognize them as his own works. Okay, it gives you an idea of he's the son-in-law of Wagner, who was also latching onto the occult ideas. There's multiple people here on the same page. Chamberlain was seen by the Germans as one of the most astonishing talents in the history of the German mind. Very influential. Kaiser Wilhelm II was one of its most enthusiastic readers and corresponded extensively with Chamberlain and used the essay-like responses in his own speeches and statements to the German people. Chamberlain's longest chapter is about the Jews and viciously anti-Semitic. Much of the philosophical basis of Nazi anti-Semitism comes from this chapter. He claimed Jesus was not a Jew but an Aryan. And he claimed Jesus was not a virgin birth. He claimed a Roman soldier and Mary got together. And that's where Jesus came from. In Mein Kampf, Hitler expresses that Chamberlain's observations were not more heeded during the Second Reich, the Second Empire, which preceded World War I. Hitler knew this writer. He knew these writings. He mentioned it in Mein Kampf. That's how much he thought about it. Chamberlain met Hitler at Wagner's Beirut in 1923. So a very close click of all these individuals. Notice that. 1924, he wrote articles for the budding Nazi party. While Hitler was in jail, wrote that Hitler was destined by God to lead the German people. And again, this goes back to the occult. They saw the demonic influence in Hitler. And they knew he was not just on a secular mission. In 1925, the Nazi newspaper celebrated Chamberlain's birthday with five columns of applaudments, hailing his foundation's book as the gospel of the Nazi movement. And so when you think of the Nazi movement, and it was involved for 10 years prior, before Hitler came to power, don't look at it as just a political entity and a political party. They were propagating these books, these teachings which are from an occult perspective, demonically dictated. The author himself told you that. Demonically dictated. German society was being marinated in this mindset. Promoted by people such as Wagner and Leighton and Gobineau. You can see Germany was being saturated and the Nazi party and Hitler as a demonic agent were not on a political mission. 
They were on an occult mission. 1901, Frederick Nietzsche's book, Will to Power, An Attempted Transvaluation of All Values. Well, that doesn't sound very promising either. A coming elite would rule the world and from whom the superman would spring. This man and the elites around him will become the lords of the earth. Wow, does this sound familiar? Strong theme of the strongmen, the masters, are above the morals of ordinary man and regain the pure conscience of a beast of prey. Hence, the superman, genius, on a mission was above the law. He was teaching that the superman who would come one day, he would be on a mission, which means he could overlook morals, overlook natural law. He was not beholden to that. He could act as a beast of prey, killing Murder, he could do whatever he want because he would be above the law. Attempted transvaluation of all values. This is going to be the mindset during the tribulation time period when the blasphemer comes onto the scene and has the same set of quote-unquote values. Frederick Nietzsche was a friend with common values with Wagner for a while. Again, peas in a pod. Their relationship fell apart after a while, but for a while they shared similar views and talked to each other. The term Lords of the Earth is a familiar expression in Hitler's Mein Kampf and is clearly used to refer to the Germans and himself as that Superman who is above the morals and law. Hitler took that term. He took the teachings of Nietzsche and applied it to himself. He said, I'm that Superman. I can act as a beast of prey, not beholden to any morals, any laws. He was lawless. And he got that last daunter from Nietzsche. And Hitler was very close friends of Frederick's sister once he passed away. And Hitler and the Nazi party promoted the book as well, too. Even Gustl, he mentioned at a very young age, Hitler was reading Nietzsche's book. So very profound and influential. All these peds are in the same pod, connected. They're in the same circles. And the same circles who influenced Hitler, but also being promoted by that quote-unquote political party, which is really an occult Children of Darkness party. 1902, Guido von Liszt, who is under the influence of the Theosophical Society by Helena Blavatsky, he went through an 11-month period of blindness, under which he received the revelation of the runes, apparently received something in a demonic vision. He claimed he could see after this 11-month period of blindness. And apparently he's using the phrase in an occult way, too, having his third eye opened. He started the Liszt Society in 1908. To propagate these occult teachings too. In 1900, Adolf Josef Lanz founded the Order of the New Templars. In 1905, Lanz founded Ostara, esoteric magazine. In 1909, Lanz claims he met the young Hitler looking for two back issues of Ostara that apparently he did not have in his possession because he was apparently a very avid reader of this esoteric magazine put out by Lanz who expounded on the works by Liszt, who was under the influence of the Theosophical Society by Helena Blavatsky. And, of course, we covered her teachings about the world teacher, too. So there's a lot of influence that is being passed down, and Hitler would have been soaking up all these different writers. Gobineau, Chamberlain, Wagner, Leighton, all of them. And you can start to see how they're building on each other. They're working in closed circles. And so because these circles are close, when someone would be interested in the occult, such as a young Hitler, he would automatically be referred to all the other books and all the other societies and introduced to any of them that are right in that area too. So he's not just coming across these writers. He's being marinated in because they are in very close circles in the area where he lives. So it wasn't like this was happening on some other continent or somewhere else. It was happening right where he just happened to be, which also wasn't too far away from Berlin, which is where the seat of Satan was being brought to at this occult time too, when the occult is rising, the demonic presence is rising in this region. I wonder why. I wonder why. 1913 is interesting because Trotsky, Lenin, and Hitler were all in Vienna at the same time for a very short time, and they possibly 
may have crossed paths at a place called the Café Central, which was a known place to intellectuals and revolutionaries. And because those were small circles, they would have recognized each other. And revolutionaries, flamboyant characters, they can recognize other revolutionaries too. So it's wondered if they crossed paths at all, and especially if Adolf Hitler may have been an agent around that time too. Just We know they were all in that area in Vienna at the same time, so a lot of historians wonder what was going on. And also the Archduke lived nearby, who was assassinated in 1914, and that's what started World War I. So there's a lot that's going on in Vienna. Vienna is a very important place at this very important historic time. And of course in Vienna, Hitler eventually became a tramp. He literally lived in the gutter for a while too. He was completely destitute because of his lack of education. He couldn't be accepted into the universities. He really didn't have the art ability that he thought he had. He couldn't get into the architectural schools. And so he is pretty much at a dead end in his life. And so he actually welcomed the start of World War I because it actually gave him a purpose and gave him something to do. Of course, there is some suspicion of the circles that Hitler may have been in in his later years in Vienna just prior to World War I starting, because apparently when he did start, he was not accepted on health grounds because his health was very poor, which is one reason why apparently he became a dispatch runner, and not being on the front lines as a normal soldier, he just did not have the health constitution for that. But that brings up questions of, who was he involved with between the time of Vienna and getting that position? Who helped him get that position? Because that position is part of his history that is varnished over. So there are questions of, obviously it's apparent that people are pulling strings for him from very early on in World War I. Obviously also him being influenced prior to that point by the occult circles too. Now, one historic highlight of World War I is when it ended November 11th at the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month. A lot of people will remember that, 1918, the armistice to end the fighting. And a lot of people aren't familiar, though. This caught the German army by surprise. They were not aware that their leaders called for this ending of fighting. And partly because a lot of the soldiers in the army and even the civilians in Germany, this came a surprise to a lot of people. Of I thought we were winning. Why are we calling for, why are we surrendering? So a lot of Germans were really surprised when the war just suddenly ended because they were told by their propaganda sources and whatnot in the army, they thought they were winning. So November 11th was a surprise to most of Germany. It was a very huge disappointment because, again, they thought they were winning, so they started blaming, we were stabbed in the back by our leaders. They told us we were winning. We must have been betrayed by our leaders. And so German society really started looking for a scapegoat. Who do we blame for this sudden surrender, us losing the war? We shouldn't have lost the war. I mean, we're second to England. Remember, in industry, the size of our army, there's no reason why we should have lost. We were betrayed, obviously. Of course, that's debatable, but that was the sentiment going around. They viewed themselves as being betrayed by their own leaders and influential people within Germany. Because, again, they, they saw no reason why they should be surrendering. And it was just a complete surprise. They felt betrayed. And so there is a mentality that went into effect right away associating November as the betrayal of the German people. From, their, from the inside. And they call it the stabbed in the back, a.k.a. also known as it's the Jews' fault. They called it stabbed in the back. Because who did they start blaming? They started blaming the Jews. Which, again, going back to Vienna nearby and just all the Jewish refugees who had been flooding through that area. And they were also blaming the Rothschilds too. Jewish financial interests. They saw all this as a concerted effort against the Germans, them as Germans, a betrayal. And so they called it the stabbed in the back, the November betrayal. In 1914, the Ottoman Empire formally allied with Germany. So that was at the beginning of World War I. Remember, the Ottoman Empire had possession of the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, that whole region. The Ottoman Empire had that, and they are now brought into this war in 1914 by being allied with Germany. That's not accidental. 
In October 1918, after the failed spring offensive, the German armies were in retreat. Allies Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire had collapsed, and Bulgaria had surrendered. The Treaty of Versailles imposed post-war reparation costs of 132 billion gold marks, which is around $269 billion today, as well as limiting the army to 100,000 men and disallowing conscription, armored vehicles, submarines, aircraft, and more than six battleships. The consequential economic devastation, later exasperated by the Great Depression, as well as humiliation and outrage experienced by the German population, are considered leading factors in the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Okay, so pay attention to what's going on on the geopolitical front. At the beginning of World War I, the Ottoman Empire, which owns Israel's territory, they allied with Germany. By the end of the war, because they got involved in this war and fighting too, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. How convenient. But the German armies were in retreat, and the Treaty of Versailles was imposed on them with huge reparation costs. $269 billion. So that was a lot of money, and then obviously they had to limit all their army and all that too. And historians see these factors as leading to the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazism. There's a lot of resentment because of what was imposed on them. But in the background, what's going on is the Ottoman Empire collapsed. The land of Israel is starting to be available for potential use. The stabbed in the back myth, you can read about that. This was, the con this was what was going through most people in Germany's mind. When Hitler came to power, he did not make the people anti-Semitic. They were already very frustrated. There's a lot of these sentiments and mentality already there since the end of World War I, and it had already been growing since Hitler's time in Vienna a few years before that because of all the writers down through the decades, the German writers who were pushing these ideas of racism and anti-Semitism too. But it really came to a head with World War I, the end of it. The November betrayal is how they often see it and talked about the November criminals and their leadership who were responsible for this. So this is what's going on through Germany right when Hitler gets out of the war. Right when he's still a dispatch runner, he's just a lowly peon, nobody knows who he is. This is the sentiment that is already going through Germany. So when the early Nazi party started promoting and trying to do rallies, they were playing on a sentiment that was already there in society. Because a lot of resentment was toward those that they blamed as a scapegoat for why Germany surrendered and contributed to its situation. That was already the sentiment ripe throughout Germany. The stabbed in the back myth, the November criminals. And so by 1923, a decade before Hitler even came to power, he's already doing rallies with the early Nazi party, and they're having a huge turnout because he's tapping into frustrations of the people. He can read the crowd, he can read the people, he knows they have this beef going on. And so, prior to his time in Vienna, he, he was not anti-Semitic, apparently, whatsoever, but he knew he could latch onto it. And apparently, the army who was pulling his strings and had blackmail information on him, they saw in him a political puppet who could further their national needs to bring the army back to power. So they had a vested interest in this revolutionary figure who could whip up a crowd, but Again, they're playing on a sentiment that was already there. And so this is what you need to keep in mind when you look at what's going on. Why, why did Hitler apparently come out of nowhere? Because people were helping him. They were using him as a puppet and as an agent. And he made a very good agent for change as a revolutionary because he was naturally a fiery individual. And that's what you need in a revolutionary. Someone who is already fierce and fiery and can whip up a crowd, especially when that crowd already seems and has different slights and they seem to be on a beef already. You can have a fiery, fierce individual take advantage of that, even if it's not something that they normally have in of themselves. They can latch onto that beef and really throw gasoline on that fire deliberately as an agent of change. And so a few months after the November armistice, that's when the actual Treaty of Versailles, when they, in fact, when they hashed out the details and the surrender there, that's when the war reparations went into effect, the mandates, the territorial changes, the military restrictions. 
But the Germans also saw this as the betrayal. They referred to it as the dictate. Because when all these negotiations were going on and formalizing all these details, the German negotiating team was not brought to the table to negotiate on any of this. They were literally given the paper and told, sign it. There is no negotiation. We are dictating these terms to you. You have no choice but to sign it. And so the German people already felt betrayed by the November betrayal, by the November criminals, and then they are slapped in the face with a dictate. of saying, sign this. You are going to agree to pay all this money back to us. And so this is really stirring resentment in Germany, and the average German is looking for a scapegoat to vent their anger on. That's the condition going on. But the Treaty of Versailles was so heavy-handed with its restrictions and the costs that would be imposed on the German industry that anybody looking at it knew that this was going to make war inevitable in 20 years. Because you're ticking off the German people, you're putting them in shackles, you're going to build resentment to where they're going to smack you back in about 20 years. Once they get the next whole generation of soldiers up and running, they're going to fight back against this because this is ridiculous, the terms of this treaty. And so, again, this is the order out of chaos mentality. You create conditions that will create a condition. You will be very heavy-handed to build up, to throw gasoline on the resentment of the German people that is already there so that they will beg for a very strong revolutionary leader. One who they just happen to also be able to provide, who comes onto the scene a fiery and fierce individual who whips up the crowds against their common enemy, the November criminals who stabbed him in the back. How convenient that he was able to slide into these conditions and be the agent of change that would steer it in a certain direction. So in 1918, Anton Drexler formed a branch of the Free Workers Committee for a Good Peace with supporter Dietrich Eckhart. And that led to 1919, the German Worker Party. And by 1920, that had transformed into the National Socialist German Workers Party, which we know as the Nazi Party. So right at the end of the war, these sentiments, people were already building up nationalist parties and societies saying something needs to be done in our country because we were stabbed in the back. So already starting to take advantage of this forming political parties, which became the Nazi party, which really stood out because they had a very fiery leader. There were other nationalist parties, plenty of them in Germany, but the one thing that made the Nazi party really stand out was Adolf Hitler because he was such a fiery, branded individual. All the other political parties, they were trying to approach it from a political point of view, of, oh, let's work through the political system and voting and whatnot, and let's eventually try to correct society, and let's try to correct and save Germany. Whereas the Nazi party with Hitler, because of Hitler's attitude, because he is so fierce and so belligerent and so dogmatic, he did not compromise. He made that very clear early on. It's my way or the highway. We're not negotiating. This is what we want. This is what we're going to get. And if it requires revolution, we're going to do it. And so that really whipped up the people because they saw, hey, this is a bold leader. This is what we really need. We don't need politicians. We don't need talk. We got plenty of talk. We need somebody who's willing to actually do something. And this Adolf Hitler guy looks like he's the guy to do it. And so he's playing all these situations feeling out the crowd, and acting accordingly, whipping up the crowd. But again, this is not a political party. What is going on here? View it as the children of darkness are working here. This is a cult work, taking advantage of situations, thesis and antithesis for their synthesis. And so you will see with how they've laid the groundwork, the, the occult foundations and the books, and manipulating, and they seem to have the puppet strings of Hitler, they have information on him, so they will steer him where they want to go. But they're also going to bring mentors specifically to his side who will guide him to be the agent of change that they want. So at this time, Dietrich Eckhart came alongside Hitler. He's been called the spiritual co-founder of Nazism. He was a key influencer on Hitler as a mentor. So much so that Hitler dedicated Mein Kampf to him. In the second edition, the dedication is literally the last words in the whole book. 
dedicated to Dietrich Edhart, where he really praises the influence that he had. And that influence was not just on Hitler. When you consider Hitler's now promoting this occult writer, the Nazi party is now promoting and endorsing this occult writer. These teachings and this mindset is also spreading through Germany too. All those who are interested in following along with the Nazi party. Dietrich Eckhart published the anti-Semitic weekly in plain German with financial support from the Thull Society. He saw World War I as plotted by the Jews of the German and Russian empires. So that was his perspective, but he is also very much into the occult too. So he's playing these political sentiments that are present for political purposes, but they have their other occult purposes too. He's the spiritual co-founder of Nazism. The Thole Society was founded right around that time, 1918, an influential German occultist group formed as an outgrowth of the Theosophical Society. So that gives you an idea of the teachings that they have here with that world master and all that. Believed in the coming of a German messiah to redeem Germany. So again, all these mentors are now coming alongside Hitler. And he's already predisposed in a demonic way to be the savior of Germany. But not in a political sense. There is that. They're going to work that. But he has allegiance to hidden superiors. And one way that Hitler is apparently giving his nod to this is, remember, he was supposedly blinded and injured by mustard gas at the end of the war in 1918. Hitler was in the hospital after the gas attacks, and surprisingly, he recovered really quickly. Claims he was blinded after the news of the November Revolution and William's abdication. He could suddenly see again, though. He claimed to hear voices announcing he was selected by God to be Germany's Messiah. Hmm. He had a miraculous recovery from a supposed blinding and claimed he could see again. Claimed he received voices he was to be Germany's Messiah. What kind of voices were those? Well, those were demonic voices. But it's interesting his account, which was told later in Mein Kampf and later on as a war hero, his claim about being blinded by mustard gas and injured by mustard gas, it's interesting because this claim was apparently doctored to match Guido von Liszt's occult awakening also, his opening of his third eye. And so when Hitler seems to be copying that same thing in, in later accounts saying, oh yeah, at that time my eyes were opened, I heard voices I was supposed to be, Germany's Messiah, He's talking and directed those statements to those in the occult, knowing. He, it was his signal to those in the know that he was an occult chosen one. You know, his account of what happened at the war came out later in the Mein Kampf and as he's trying to whip up support for the National Party there. But he's wording these events, which are varnished with the consent of those who are pulling his strings. These accounts are varnished with an occult wording. Because... They're ultimately geared toward those who know the occult. He's putting out a public occult letter statement that, Yes, I am a child of darkness, and I am on a mission. A mission that we all know what the goal is for those in the occult. And so the more that we see how his history and so many details of his time in the army in Vienna were covered up, but people knew that, and we're actively hiding that and pulling his strings when he's putting out these stories and these accounts, very crafted accounts of his history that are made up, not just by him, by those who are mentoring and guiding him. It's all being done deliberately with the wording that, yes, he is a child of darkness. He's on a occult mission, not a political mission. And this is also important to consider during the 1920s, the whole time after World War I, Occult and paganism in Germany was very trendy. It was very trendy. And so that's partly why you had all these groups popping up, Thule Society and Theosophical Societies and different groups interested in the occult. It was seen as very trendy. So you actually had a wide audience throughout Germany, Austria, the whole region there, who were familiar with occult things. And so when Hitler is making certain statements about how he's chosen for certain things and he's peppering it with certain wording of an awakening and hearing voices and wording that mirrors theosophical thought, there are a lot of people in Germany who were seeing things differently than the average person was. 
that they saw and understood Hitler was not on a political goal. It was on a spiritual mission, an occult mission, guided by the hidden superiors. And so in 1925, that is when he published Mein Kampf, and that's when he recounted a lot of the stories after some time when, of course, they're conditioning and adjusting and varnishing any details that need to be glossed over. And up leading to the publication of Mein Kampf, Dietrich Eckhart was mentoring Adolf Hitler up until 1923, two years before the book came out. All during that time after World War I, he is the spiritual co-founder of Nazism. He is right there mentoring Hitler. Eckhart said regarding Hitler, we have given him the means of communication with them. The unknown superiors, the ascended masters. That was Eckhart's job, to bring Hitler's occult education further along, to mentor him to where he was in full communication with the unknown superiors, the ascended masters, the demonic presence, the rulers of the darkness of this world. That was his job, and he said we did it. He is in communication with them. 1920, the party papers started to promote the Hitler myth. They're already starting to propagate this myth of this guy who was just a lowly soldier, but he's pulling himself up by the bootstraps. He heard visions that he's to be Germany's messiah. He's a firebrand of an individual. He is being lauded as the superior being, the genius, the chosen one. And so again, some wording does raising some eyebrows by those who are in many of the occult circles right then too. They are seeing that attention is being given to a certain individual. And major mentors who they are also familiar with are mentoring this individual too. 1921, Hitler was granted nearly absolute powers in the party as its sole leader. He soon acquired the title Führer. And there were different factions in the party who wanted to be the leader of the party, especially as it's growing in popularity because it's feeding on the sentiments of the people there. But it reached a point where Hitler said, you either make me the total leader and just follow me unquestionably, or I'm quitting. I'm going to another party. And so they say, well, you know, if he quits, <laughs> that's all of our power. That's why people listen to us is because of him as our leader and talker. He does all the talking. So, yeah, we got to let him be the leader. So that's when he really picked up the title of Fuhrer and really started getting the unquestioning obedience by that party. So he's personally starting to take the power of that. But again, he has been prepared and people are still pulling his strings, even though he is now starting to get personal power directing and steering the party. 1922, Hitler designed the swastika armbands and standards from occult sources. 1922, the Hitler Youth started. Ten years before Hitler comes to power in Germany, they are starting the Hitler Youth to indoctrinate and prepare the future soldiers for they know what is coming, what they are preparing to do. And they know the best way to do that is to start indoctrinating a generation when they're young. November 1923, that was the Beer Hall Putz. That's when they tried to do a little revolution, did not work out well at all. But in 1924, he was jailed, and that's when he dictated his Mein Kampf. And it was during his trial, though, that it was revealed that he heard voices and came up in the trial. So again, he is under demonic influence. That's, there's no question of that whatsoever. He's under mentorship of other people who hear demons, too. So there's a lot to be traced the hand of darkness through all of this. 1924, Dr. Karl Hosfer, a Blavatsky disciple, claimed to have clairvoyant powers. He schooled Hitler in Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine, during this time. Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan, he was also Hosfer's disciple, too, just to give you an idea of the influence of this individual. And Hitler had him as a mentor. That tells you everything you need to know, just looking at the circle who he surrounds himself with. Thank you for joining us in our study today looking into God's Word and fulfillment of prophecy that will follow exactly what Scripture says. So stay tuned for Part 5, Holding Fast to God's Words, the Words of Scripture. And until next time, Maranatha.